All right. I check, check, I'm good. So I'm Max Ron, Max, Max Ron, CWB Association Welding Podcast, Pod, Pod, Podcast. Today we have a really cool guest, Welding Podcast. The show is about to begin. back to another edition of the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max Saron and I'm with you guys as always here to share another fantastic story of a young man in Alberta. His name is Rylan Monkman and he's coming to us to talk to us about his journey, um, kind of his path through the trades and and kind of where he's gone and, and where he's ended up now, which is a really interesting place. So Rylan, how's it going? Pretty good. How are you, Max? I'm doing good. Today's been a busy day, but I saw a meme about that and everyone's, the meme was like, everyone's just busy, busy, busy. And so I try not to say that, but it's true. I had a busy day. And yourself, were you, were you busy today? Oh yeah, it's always busy and just trying to keep myself motivated. I work from home as it looks like yourself. So it's mm-hmm. sometimes hard to want get, to get going and push yourself, but yeah, it's a busy day. Well, you know, the secret for me was building an office. I like got like into it and like I repainted got bookshelves like on Virage sale and got a desk and and made it like uh like work so now when I'm here it actually doesn't feel like I'm trapped so much or like I can just like ooh slide away I feel like I'm actually at work so that helps I had my office set up but then uh my dad's moving into my house so I had to take my bedroom from downstairs <laughs> put into my office upstairs and so my trick is just lock myself in my room. I don't get out of here. And then <laughs> the day ends and I'm good to go. Awesome. Well, Rylan, let's start with let's start the, with your story here. So first of all, um, where are you right now? Where where are you living? So I'm I'm living in Spruce Grove, which is just outside of Edmonton, Alberta. Born and raised in Edmonton, Alberta, so I haven't really gone far. It's about ten minutes outside of Edmonton. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, are you an Edmonton lover? You love the town of Edmonton. No, I'm just stuck here. My family's here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my wife's from BC. I want to move to BC, but, you know, we got all my family here. and We kind of grew up here, so I don't want to just hop ship yet. But we're slowly moving away from the city to, like, work away to BC. You know, it's funny because in, in Alberta, and I'll say this, you know, someone's going to send me some hate mail, but I love Edmonton. I think Edmonton's a fun town. There's good stuff, good people. Lots of trades there, which I vibe with. You know, it's a... It's a good setup. And for everybody in Saskatchewan that I ever knew that was moving away to BC, I never said goodbye. I said, see you later, because they all ended up coming back. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, best of luck to you. BC is beautiful. My family was out there 20 years. Um, So they were out in Richmond. And and who doesn't love BC? Like, I mean, it's beautiful, right? So I don't see it anytime soon, but slowly, slowly I'll, I'll get closer to those mountains. Good, good. And okay, so Rylan, you're born, bred Edmonton, so you're an E-Town boy. What, uh, what was your path? Like, you know, just so people know, I guess, wh- what do you do now? What's the trade you have? So I am a dual Red Seal auto body technician. So I have a Red Seal in refinishing and a Red Seal technician. Um, so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, but I'm not currently working in auto body. I started when I was... Uh, I'll kind of go back to where my story kind of starts. I'll work yeah, my way into my Yeah, take us back to here. like, you know, you little baby Rylan coming up in Edmonton. So, yeah, like I said, born and raised in Edmonton. Um, my parents were together when I was in kindergarten, play school, but they got a divorce. And I, I kind of still really remember that. And that was kind of where my life started. When, that's when I noticed things were falling apart on me. We moved into these townhomes, me, my mom, and my brothers. And... They're kind of more low-income townhomes. You know, we went from a house to a townhomes, parents divorced, and it's kind of rapidly falling apart. I was just starting kindergarten. Life was moving on. And, but my mom opened a day home, which we had a lot of kids coming in and out of this day home, and it was, it was amazing. I thought it was, it was fantastic. You know, we had kids always to play with. They came to our school with us. We had a good little community going. But then my mom got sick, and she had to give up the day home and then my dad moved back in they tried to make things work trying to you know i don't know if it's trying to help each other or, or what happened at that time which is when life pretty much just fell apart um drugs became a normal thing my family um, my mom my dad were both addicts and it got to the point where they slept all day like my dad would still go to work but my mom would sleep all day and be up all night and it just became 
I'm about grade three, so I'd put me like eight years old, and it's that's when my life really started. Um, so that's when I started feeling I was an adult. I, I treated myself as an adult. I didn't care what my parents had to say. I knew what they were doing behind the scenes, not all of it, but they're they're kind of pretty open about it. My mom would tell me some things, and so my head was like, well, if you can do this stuff, and I know it's bad, what I do is nothing. So why do I care? And the grade four is when it completely just fell apart. We I went I went to school probably a quarter of the amount of time I was supposed to. My my mom just wouldn't get us there, uh, or she was embarrassed to take us there. You know, it's at the lowest deepest point of her life. Mm-hmm. We had no food. We had like we barely had multiple times power was off. We didn't have you know water. My grandparents would have to come over and pay our bills, or you know the food bank was our our friend. And so there was a lot of struggle, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And that's what continued to be my life. And but growing up into it, it wasn't really like it was crazy for me. Like looking back as an adult, yeah, the life was crazy and hectic and like. But as a child going through this, it was just my life. I grew up in these townhomes, and the kids that were there, Mm -hmm. yeah, they were the same thing. And I thought it was fine. Great, I could go up and down the neighborhood. I'm knocking all these doors, get all my friends to come out. We have full soccer games, football games. And we all had the same kind of struggles. So it wasn't like we we're like, oh, you didn't eat today? That wasn't the talk. It was like, oh, hey, let's go play soccer because we both have dirty clothes. We both smell like crap. You know, we, when you grow up poor with poor people, you don't stand out if you're poor. Yeah. So it wasn't until grade seven that, you know, I got more freedom. I started to bus to school by myself. So I got to hang out with different people from the different parts of Edmonton. And now my little town is not so little anymore. And I'm standing out you know people have the newest coolest clothes they have the skateboards they have nice bag backpacks they have you know all the gadgets they have like all this stuff and it's not possible for me to ever achieve this stuff so i had to kind of start working and make my own money and doing things on the side and and of course you know he's trying to start keeping up with this stuff and that's how i started feeling i didn't need my parents anymore i was already taking care of myself i was taking care of my little brother during this as well we're three years different but i always made sure he was taken care of. We always made sure he was safe. He got fed first. It was that was my little son. Is pretty much how I raised him. And yeah, so grade seven, and I was just sick and tired of it. I was done. You know, I, I stand out now. I have to buy my own cell phone to have a cell phone. I have to buy my own minutes to have minutes on the phone. Um, if I wanted like an iPad, you know, everybody's on those iPod. I forget what they were like nanos at the time well i had to buy myself an ipod shuffle which was like the lower part of it but i'm trying to keep up with these kids that all had cool toys and phones and so even me trying my hardest i always was just that kid you know i was so i hated it i hated being poor i hated just not having that stuff or not be able to do anything or not you know always worrying about if the power's gonna be shut off we you know we obviously didn't have cable you didn't have those luxuries of anything nice we didn't even have internet at home. We didn't have a computer until I left. So it's just, that's when I really started realizing no, I'm sick and tired of this. And you know that that perception that you have as a kid is given to you from the outside, right? Because when you're in it, in the moment, you don't know, right? Because it's just life, right? You're just living. Like I know when we came to Canada, we came here, we were exiled. And that's a different, people... A lot of people don't understand the different types of refugees or immigrants that there is. We were exiled, which means we were basically not allowed to return to our country. and We had nowhere to go. And we ended up in Canada. And so being here, no, like no plan, no money, no language. And 100%, we hung out with the poor people. We hang out with the, you know, the, the poor areas. We lived in the areas where everyone's the same. Everyone's got something. Addictions are everywhere because that's something that... You know that as I know now as an adult, that's a trauma response. You you you've experienced trauma. Your parents went through traumatic things, and the 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 addictions are a crutch. And once that crutch is started, it's hard to get off of a crutch. And people say just get better, but you don't go out and kick a crutch out from someone using it on the street. You'd never do that. But yet you look at people with addictions as like just get better, and that's not a thing. You have to address trauma. And for you as a kid coming up. 100%. Like, man, I'll tell you a story. I was a kid and Converse All Stars were like all the rage. Okay. So I was in grade six or seven 
and all the kids were getting these Converse All Stars, and they're exp- they're st- like, I mean, they're still expensive, right? I told my mom, and I remember I was like crying because like I wanted to get these runners so bad, and blah blah blah. So I was like hitting ditches, picking up bottles, doing whatever I can to you know get money. I finally got the money, and I gave it to my mom. I said, "Can you go get me these runners?" And she's like, "Okay, I'll go get them." And she went to Zeller's and bought me like no name Converse All Stars, like like Bonverse Ball Stars, like not even the right thing. And she came back and gave them to me. And obviously, like, this wasn't right, but I didn't even get it. I was like, cool, I got the runners. I put them on, and I wore them to school, and I was walking to school, and I was so proud of these runners that I was wearing. And as soon as I got to school, all the kids started laughing at my no-name shoes. And I went home crying. I took. The, I didn't go back to school that day. I, like, cried all afternoon being like, man, I saved up all my money. My mom got me these runners, and they're still not the right ones. Like, there's just no way... I'll ever be a part of that group. You know what I mean? And that's exactly what you're saying you were in. And you feel like you're so alone, but you don't know that there's millions of people in the exact same position as you at that moment. You know, so now, now, back to you, we're coming up grade seven. This is definitely formative years now, right? Now it is. Like, you can start working for real. You're, you can, you know, you're getting close to high school age where now you start getting real independent. So what's going on in Ryland's life now? So grade seven, I was still living at home with my mom, and yeah, I was just just trying to make that life for me, not be poor anymore. I didn't want to associate with that. I was embarrassed. I was just done with it. So then grade eight came around, and I was 13, 14, and there's things that I've done that I'm not proud of, but I just kind of broke my mom. You know, I was just, we didn't agree, we'd fight. It'd be the point where I've never hit my mom, I never raised my hand to my mom. But it's just there's so much they had to hold back that anger where I just it wasn't a good relationship in that house. Toxic. Yeah. Super toxic. Like she would hit me, like, no problem. And it, it, as a kid, once again, that was whatever, right? My mom and mm-hmm. dad hit me, sure, whatever. I didn't get didn't see it as abuse. It's just, it's just settle down, you know? Mm-hmm. So it just it took so much just to kind of hold this back where finally she's just like, get out, get out of my house now. And it was obviously a lot bigger than that, a bigger fight. Surprise the cops didn't show up. And uh so uh, it was winter time, I just walked out. I was grabbing, I went to go grab my coat. And she's like, I paid for that coat. I'm like, whatever. I threw it on the table. I'm like, I paid for my bus pass and I walked out. And uh, 14 years old and just never went back. And so I moved to my grandparents right after that. So I hopped on the bus. It was like freezing cold outside. I remember it was like an hour bus ride. But I'm like, screw it. I'm not going back home. I'm not caving in. So I get out to my grandparents and they let me live with them. But they lived in a two-bedroom apartment. They both had their own bedrooms. They both smoked a pack of cigarettes each. You know, it was like there was tar dripping off the little, like, roof and stuff. Like, it was just, <laughs> yeah. I slept on the couch. I was grateful, right? At least I'm not homeless at this point yet. So I'm sleeping on this couch and they're good. They fed me. They made sure I was home on time or they wanted me to be. But I was already so set in my ways of being an adult that I continued to, like, disobey them but they they're really cool grandparents they're just like if you show up tomorrow show up tomorrow just please let me know you're not gonna die give me a call just say hey you're not coming home that's all they wanted <laughs> so i was like okay it's a, it's a good little starting point yeah but i wanted to live with my dad and his girlfriend so i lived with them for a bit and she had two kids about my age and we disagreed and then she gave him the ultimatum me or him so me and my dad moved out i, I was surprised i thought for sure my dad was going to stay with her but after she's like, you choose your son or me. And he's like, hey, we're out. Have a good one. I was like, really? Like, awesome. <laughs> I guess me and my dad are moving out. But it's just something I didn't expect, you know, because me and my dad, like, he's, he's always more of my friend, not so much a dad to me. And it's kind of how that relationship, and it still is to this day, it's kind of more like we're just good friends. But anyway, so we moved out to this house on the north side of Edmonton, and I thought finally life's starting to look up. Finally got my own place. Before, from when I moved my grandparents to this point, I moved around between 14 to 15 times, just bouncing back and forth, living on my backpack. Everything I owned was fit on my school backpack. Everything, every clothing, my toys, my everything. So I just moved around constantly back and forth, the couches to my grandparents, to my dad's, to my grandparents, to friends, just around and around and around I go. And this was from grade nine only. Grade 10, we got our own place and I remember, like, for example, I wanted to go to St. Joe's. It's a trade school here. And I wanted to go to be a mechanic. That's the reason I went to that school. 
um, I knew nothing else about this school and I was just like, I'm going to St. Joe's, I'm going to become a mechanic and this I was going to be. So I went to the open house by myself. I registered by myself. I paid for my school fees. You know, everything was on me. So grade 10, you're 15 years old, 14, 15 years old. And mm-hmm. I had to do everything myself. My dad wasn't there. I actually came to the open house drunk, just f- faced and, you know, but that's just what I expected after he was late and drunk and, and trying to pick a fight with somebody or just being loud and obnoxious. <laughs> right. So just like, I just did it myself. I wanted to go to the school. So uh, yeah, whatever. I get into the St. Joe's here and grade 10 starts and I realized it's not a normal school. There's a, it's a program called the PSDL. So personalized self-directed learning program. It's where they said, here's your modules, get them done by this time. There's classes or there's rooms you can sit on. You can talk to teachers, but it wasn't, you go to a classroom and you learn by teachers like here, learn by yourself. It took me pretty much all of grade 10 to figure out how this works. And by the end of grade 10, I only have like 10 credits and I'm just like, I'm going to get kicked out of school. I'm failing. I don't know how this program works. It's not a normal class, but I would just wanted to go for mechanics. I didn't even take mechanics. Uh, the <laughs> class, the class was too full. At first I walked in and it was just packed with kids. Everybody wanted to be a mechanic and well, the auto body class was next door. So I thought, well, let's go to auto body. Check that out. I, I was interested with auto body too. So I just go next door. There's like two kids in the class. And I'm like, this is more my, my speed. I don't want to have a packed <laughs> class of 80 kids all in here. There's like three or four of us. And I convinced a couple of my friends to join me. And, and then that's how I got into auto body and get into the trades at that point. So, you know, yeah, it's, that, it's, it's so interesting when you talk about feeling like an adult at a really early age and it's so interesting to me how the human brain evolves right so when you're young and you feel like you're an adult you feel like i have my responsibilities covered i'm making my own money i know what to do things and you think that being an adult means staking your claim and making demands and demanding respect and all these things and it isn't until you get much older that you realize that that's exactly the opposite of what a good adult does, right? A good adult respects people's space, is friendly and helpful and supportive. And that's what an adult's supposed to be. Because, man, I remember, I think all humans go through that in some way or another. When you're 14, 15, and you just think you got it all figured out. And 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 it's, it's in retrospect, kind of kind of funny that how bad you don't have it figured out so exactly like right. yeah and you so now you're looking at auto body i thought about auto body when i was a kid too because like i mean i love cars i've always loved cars um i love working on cars i've always been buying like crappy cars when i was a kid and fixing them up and 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 auto body always looked like it was like too hard to me like a lot of work you know and what did you feel like going into the auto body program there yeah, it's kind of, I, I used to watch shows on TV about fixed up cars, but they would like show months of progress in two minutes. So you'd look, oh, look, <laughs> it's nice and painted. Like, fantastic, right? So in my head, I had this expectation of it was going to be a lot quicker in the process and we can achieve outcomes. Well, I get there and, you know, the first like month, you're just learning about safety and you're talking about tools. And I'm like, I thought I knew tools because my dad's a heavy duty mechanic. I grew up in the shops with him. I helped him when I could. Um, not, not like all the time, but I was still around tools. I would still like when you're learning and you have to know like a whole book of every single tool. And like, what's this? What's mm-hmm. this? What's this? What's the name of this? And you're like, I, I don't know. So I started feeling a little panicked on it, but it's the only thing I actually enjoyed going to school for. Like, cause with that personalized self-directed learning program, I didn't have to be in school so I could skip school all day and just do nothing and hand in some modules. We actually, you're supposed to, okay. If St. Joe's is listening, you're supposed to go to school and be there and <laughs> participate. But I was living on my own pretty much. Like when I was with my dad, I could just come and go as I pleased. He was at work and I was just, yeah, I didn't have to go to school. I could stay home all day and get a phone call. And it's just like, he was like, whatever. And I actually changed it where I was an independent student as well because I was pretty much living on my own. So they had my cell phone number. I'll get into the story in a second here. But, but um, yeah, Auto Body was... It's the only thing I went to school for, and my teacher I seen my my skill in it. And he, in auto body, we weren't the most academically brilliant students in here. I'm not saying anybody in auto body is like a level, but us going into here, we're the ones that aren't doing so good in school. So we're going to be in auto body because we feel this is our passion more than reading books and writing essays. More aligned with your skill set. Exactly. I learn yeah. by doing, seeing, and then 
I can accomplish. Not reading something and accomplishing it's not how I work. Like I have to read something three times to understand it. But at least in auto body it was like, we could do this. These are the reasons we're doing it. Now you do it and you can achieve it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I got really good at it. And I, my teacher asked me if I wanted to compete in Skills Canada. And I was like, yeah, was like why not? So he started teaching us more advanced things in grade 10. And I didn't place in any positions in Skills Canada. I got like fourth three years in a row, but whatever. The person ahead of me that was on my team that got third, I was, I was always ahead of him on the circuit. I told him what to expect and what the judges were critiquing <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. So was, I could have been more competitive, but at least we were on the podium with my school. But So I never actually placed anywhere, but it, it was a good experience. For sure. And fourth ain't bad, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And at the time I was like, oh, damn, I didn't get a first or second or... <laughs> But I was just went from this being this kid that really had no experience, not even know what tools are, and the teacher started kind of pushing me and guiding me and mentoring me and giving me this extra help and after school time to practice for Skills Canada and I started realizing like this is a pretty decent um, occupation, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I can paint, I can weld, I can do like just tons of stuff. Even like just there's so much to auto body that it became a very enjoyable trade and I was good at it. So that's kind of where I, the only reason I went to school and continue to push, but the, towards the end of grade 10, my life once again fell apart. My dad had his demons come back, couldn't afford the rent anymore. We got evicted, sheriff show up, you have 24 hours to leave this property, take what you can. So I loom my backpack back up and I'm out. So now I'm completely homeless. I got nowhere to go. My dad's gone. I call my mom, I'm like, hey mom, I need somewhere to come. She's like, yeah, sure. So whatever, I show back up. That lasts like a week. Huge blows up again. She gets suicidal. I'm like, yeah, this is done. I can't be here anymore. So I leave again. My girlfriend, me and her dad kind of got along. I told him what's going on and he let me stay with them for a bit. And which was great, you know, I wouldn't let no boy live. I've got two kids, I got a daughter. There's no way in hell some (laughs) 15 year old kids coming to stay at at my house with him but he too like my wife has a great story as well um, even worse than mine but um so her dad was he had his own demons didn't really care so much he's like yeah come come live with us so i'm living there and this is going into grade 11 and now i'm, I'm working a full-time job i'm trying to stay in school trying to make some money trying to pay the bills and life's just kind of like going too fast and my girlfriend breaks this drops this bomb on me i'm pregnant mm-hmm. i'm like we're homeless i have barely making ends meet i'm trying to finish school i'm only in grade 11 like what do we do right and so whatever she's like well i'm keeping it if you don't want to be a part of it there's the door please leave I'm like no I'm, I'm not i'm not gonna have a child on this earth that's my child that i'm not raising my dad wasn't there as much as i wanted wasn't a very good dad you know I wanted to be what I wish I had so that was my decision at that point and we stuck it out you know so I made a promise to my girlfriend my wife now I said okay I'll quit drinking I'll quit doing drugs I'll sparring up this is this is where we're going so it wasn't easy it wasn't like overnight just life changed and we're all like hey look <laughs> life's all great and fine and dandy I'm, I'm working this job that I thought was going to be decent. I was doing trailer work, like semi-trailers. So I was like doing first year apprentice semi stuff, working on this really shady shop with no safety. Mm-hmm. They didn't care anything. And I thought, okay, I'm going to quit school. I'm going to go work here. Life will be great. I'm making, I was making like 18 bucks an hour when minimum wage was like 10. So I was, I was, I was You're doing pretty good. <laughs> exactly, right? I was busing to school still or busing everywhere. So no car payments, no nothing. Yeah. And uh, so... January comes around and they, they're like, sorry. It was like 2007, 2008 so when the economy started to just tank. And I go in one day, like, mm-hmm. oh, sorry, we got to let you go. And I'm like, what do you mean you got to let me go? Like, I was coming in here to come work full time. Like, I wanted this to be my job. I was going to quit school. I was going to come do this during the days. They're like, well, sorry, you got nothing. And I'm like, I'm expecting a kid, right? Or no, I saw my son was <laughs> just born. He was like a month old. Um, yeah, life was just like <sighs> over again. So there's these ups and downs that were just constant in my life, like all the time. So I just got to the point where I was like, I'm expecting things to always fall apart. So 
my girlfriend's dad he said he's like okay i'm moving out moving to a different place you got to come with us if you want or not and my wife didn't want to bring a child into this earth living there because once again he had his own demons and his own problems and she didn't want a son or a kid raised around him so she said mm-hmm. we made a decision no we'll find somewhere else to live and one of her friends let us live with them for a bit but they're going through a breakup and we we're living in this little basement with no windows and it was like it was, it was just a place to sleep again and so it just didn't feel it, like a home in any way yeah oh it's zero it was like we didn't have a key yet. you slept you went downstairs we had like a little bed in the corner of this basement with like the vents and no windows and but it was just a place just to crash you know we we're still in school we we're still my wife was working and going to school and so we had to do what we had to do whatever right but they're like oh we're breaking up you have till january 1st um january 1st we're done we're moving out yeah so that was right before i lost my job and blah 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 so we found a basement suite of a friend's mom that had a basement suite she didn't want to rent to us i had to like beg and plea because i'm 16 years old at this time and she's like i don't want no kids living in my basement i'm like well like i need somewhere to live like you don't understand like we have nothing (laughs) she's like well if you can come up with first month's last month's rent you can live here for a few months we'll see where this goes so whatever we sign it she lets us live with her own basement suite finally we have it's our own bathroom our own bed door locks it finally feels like the first step to like, okay, we're, we're making it like life's mm-hmm. looking a little bit up. Something but safe. Then, yeah. Something safe. But then we're still living like living with my mom. You know, we couldn't have friends over. I couldn't drink. I couldn't, you know, all these things that my last mom, my real mom couldn't tell me to do. And now I'm paying for rent and you're telling me I can't have my friends over. You're telling me I can't. So we stayed there for six months. I followed her rules because I didn't want to go homeless. And we moved out and got a, our own townhouse so that's let's say right before summer grade 11 or summer grade 12 grade 11 grade 12 um but before i get into that part of the story this is where careers the next generation the company i currently work for now is where it comes into my life so when i was going to drop out of school and i got laid off there i was like what do i do i have nothing um, what, what am i doing like where am i going i'm having this child how am I going to provide for this? So there's a program in Edmonton called the Registered or in Alberta called the Registered Apprenticeship Program or RAP. And it takes high school students and gives them opportunities to explore the trades, more occupations now, but at the, the trades. And I knew about them, I've heard about it, and I was kind of like, okay, how do I get into this? So with help of some of my teachers, they help me catch up on my schoolwork. I focused because they don't just take they don't take anybody. You have to be mm-hmm. on track to graduate to get into this program. And I was far from on track. Like the only credits I had were in auto body. So I had to catch up on all my English, my sciences, my math. Um, I did bare minimums, you know, like the 14s and mm-hmm. whatever, but I dumbed it down and I pushed myself and I was able to start continue to do my homework, you know, really, really focused on it because I'm going to be a dad right, right before this happened. Right? I was like, I need to get this focused. So I caught up got enrolled in the Registered Apprenticeship Program, and I, I was already in auto body, and I was good at auto body. I know what I was doing in auto body, so I thought, well, let's get enrolled in auto body. Well, like, why not? Is mine as well. So I got a position with, it's called Herbers Auto Body. They have five locations in Edmonton, and they gave me a start to work in the wash bay. So grade 11 and grade 12, I was working five days a week, washing cars, you know, kind of starting my apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. And I was making minimum wage at that time. So I went back, you know, I was making 18 bucks an hour back to like 10 bucks an hour. But it's steady. It was exactly yeah. it was Monday to Friday or yeah, Monday to Friday. And it was that advancement opportunity because I knew mm-hmm. I could make I could make a living. This is a career. This is a passion. Um, and I don't need to be a doctor and I don't have all like my education was not where it should have been. Obviously, as an adult now, I wish mm-hmm. I put more time in that, you know, but. I didn't expect that's going to be where I am today. So I got enrolled, got a position and kept working. And it wasn't what I expected. I was washing cars, you know, just, just a detailer moving stuff around. But I was watching the body men and they were getting paid flat rate. So they'd come in from like eight to two sometimes. And they'd be like, oh, it made my 15 hours. I'm going home. I'm like 15 hours. What do you mean you're making 15 hours? So like, oh, I got paid piecework. You know, whatever you accomplish, you get paid. And the preppers were on it as well. So I was like, you guys are getting paid like 20 bucks or 20 hours a day. 
They're like, oh yeah, I can make 24 hours a day, no problem. If you're really pushed and you're good at it. So I was like, so you're telling me like some of these body men were making 10 grand take home a month. And I was like, I can be doing this. So I really <laughs> kind of started when I had free time, I was working with the preppers and just doing free work for them. Just, just learning, just put it on myself. And I was like, cause they weren't pushing me up. You know, you had to kind of take initiative, jump over top of people. You had to like fight and claw and teach yourself you have to prove your worth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nobody was like, Oh, here, go learn to prep. It was like, I'm like, Hey, I got nothing else to clean. I've washed the floor. I've done everything I need to do. Can I go work over here for free? Can I go do this? And, and they allowed it a little bit more, a little bit more. And I started just getting better and better at it. And then they gave me a chance to go get out of detail or yeah, detail right when I graduated, like it was like July 1st, they're like, Oh, you graduated school. You want to go to prep now? And because I did all of that prep um, during grade 12, I worked three days a week and went to school two days a week. So I was still working pretty much full time all the mm -hmm. grade 12, getting my hours towards my apprenticeship. And so I'm exiting high school with 500 credits or 500 hours towards my apprenticeship ready and starting my actual career like the second I was done high school. All right, well, let's take a break right now, right at this done high school, July 1st, starting the new job and and looks like things are on the uptick. I hope, I hope, you know, we'll see where the story goes. But uh, thanks for listening. We're here with uh, Rylan Monkman and stay tuned. We'll be back right after these messages. All right, and we're back here on the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max Saron. Today we got a very special guest, Rylan Monkman, telling us about his incredible journey as a young man coming up in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, you know, some trials and tribulations and some hardships, but, you know, all those things, uh, you know, they say a strong hammer metals or makes the metal. So, you know, sometimes you take a lot of blows, but it just makes the metal harder, right? So th this is where we're, I think we're getting to. You got a, you got a baby now. You're coming out of grade 12. You got your first little promotion, kind of first little rung on the ladder. And Rylan, how are you feeling about about the prospects at this point? Life now is finally looking up. I graduated with honors. First, like I was barely expected to graduate, but I graduated with honors. I had almost 200 credits, including because with rap, you get credits for rap. So I was up. I had my own place, me and my girlfriend with my son. It's ours. It's a complete townhouse. But I have nobody tell me what I can and cannot do. Obviously my, my landlord, but it's not living mm -hmm. on under somebody else's roof. This is mine, but comes the bills, comes the rent, comes everything else. So I just continued to work hard. My wife um, went to school, went to university for, I don't know, chemical technology or something like that. And we're kind of, we're, we're going somewhere in life. So she continued to go to school. Our son was in daycare during the days and it was just, now I'm adult. Even though I thought I was an adult, now I'm adult For real. full time. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> going to work. And I had to like bus to school still. We couldn't afford a car. I didn't I don't think I even had a license yet. No, I didn't even have my license at this time yet. So I had to bus everywhere and bus to school, bus to work. So it was like an hour one way just to get to work. So no excuses. You can't be late. You get up early, you get out the door, you catch the first bus if you have to, and you and then the walk was another like twenty minutes half an hour and I had to walk along the Yellowhead. And if you've ever been down Edmonton, when mm -hmm. you first come into the city, there's this little stretch of the Yellowhead, super narrow path. And that was my route to work. And but no excuses. I got up, did what I had to do and continued to get to work. And and uh, I was got first promotion. I was working in prep and I was completely flat rate and I was just working for myself. And the better I got, my bosses started feeding me more work. You know, if I stayed later, they fed me more work. If I showed up early, they gave me more work. And I was getting these bigger and bigger and bigger paychecks. And I was like, it's true, the harder you work, the more money you make. So why not just bust your ass and just work all day and- Just work all the time. <laughs> yeah, right? And just, and if you can see, I'm a pretty skinny guy and I don't need to eat. So I, I would skip lunches <laughs> and I would just, just work and work and work and work. And it, it helped me climb that, that ladder and get moving up. And then we changed the system to kind of a team-based system. So we're still flat rate, but now all the prep team, there's like four or five of us all piled together. And then they made this guy, this the team lead of this department. And I disagreed with him. I didn't like him. And me being this young hothead, I thought, once again, I know best. I'm, I'm going to fight for this position. So I made the guy quit, pack his toolbox up and leave. And I was like, oh, look, he couldn't even handle me. Get out of here. It's my turn. So I took over the team lead of the paint department. And I continued to build my team. And my little team I had, there's about four or five of us. And 
we worked really well together and we're, we're breaking numbers. We're doing amazing and our, our quality was great. Our cost was low and we just continued to grow and work it. And it, I was about 17, 18, I'm running my own little team. And I was like, this is what I want to do. So they promoted me to a bigger store to run a bigger team. And I was like, yeah, like, let's go, let's go for it. So I'm still going to school I'm, went for my second year and actually I went for my third year first because an auto body can skip one, three, two, four. So I went for my third year, which is body and I was still prepping and running a bigger team. And now there's about eight to 10 people on this team. And of course they're all older. They don't want to listen to this mm -hmm. punk kid come in here. They're all just, what do you know? I got underwear older than you, this and that. And, <laughs> and just so much resistance, right? But growing That's up, kind of gross. I don't want to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was their comments, right? But, but growing up, what I call my in the hood, no mm -hmm. punk guy is going to like make me feel bad about myself. I'm just like, I just continue to fight, right? Like I'm not. You've heard worse. <laughs> exactly, right? I've I put myself in worse situations than this old man, miserable that this kid that's younger than his underwear is telling him what to do now. So I, I did this with this team and I built it up and I worked with them and I, I love to train. I love to work with my apprentices. That was where I really like to pass my knowledge down and make them better than me. My goal was if I can make them better than me, I'm making a better team. Why do I want to be the best on my team when I would rather have a team better, better than me? And having a, a boss that kind of, she wanted to micromanage what I did and always tried changing what I did. And my team was always pulled back in both directions. Do we listen to the manager or do you listen to you? So then there's just this back and forth and I was getting really getting sick and tired of getting step, stepped over. You know, you put me in this position, but then you tell me, no, do it this way. But then my team would do extra miles for me. So if I said, hey, Chad, can you stay and paint this bumper for me? You know, we're running a little bit behind. I really would appreciate it. I'll, I'll get you lunch tomorrow. He would stay and do it for me. And he wouldn't expect the lunch. I'd still buy it for him. But, you know, he wasn't doing it for the lunch. He was doing it because he was helping me. But then Lodi would come down and just go do that bumper now. And he would just walk out the door and said, no. So then I was in this fight back and forth with trying to like get out of my department, let me help. And it just wasn't going, I wasn't getting that respect from where I wanted it. So I thought, okay, let's get to body work. Let's just go once again, be by myself, go learn body. And I don't, I won't have this whole team of people against me. Even my own manager was against me. So I went to body and started just doing like bumper jobs, little fast lane jobs they're called, like change a bumper, change some headlights, some brackets, take a door apart, whatever, just little stuff. And once you, you were just flat rate right again, and I was good at it. Mm -hmm. And once again, I just realized if I just stayed late, showed up early, and just worked and worked and worked and worked, you can make a killing and I could achieve what I want, right? I could pay for whatever I want. You know, I bought my first house by 21, bought my second house by 24. I started buying cars. I've always bought and sold cars, but I bought one of my first cars from the dealership, you know, brand new, fresh off the lot. And I bought my second car off the dealership. And But I was making enough cash where it's just, it wasn't an issue, right? It just I was paying mm -hmm. for these cars like right out. Like my house is still mortgaged, obviously. I'm not that rich yet. But everything else was just coming and I was, was making more money and I was working harder and chasing it, chasing it, chasing it. And it got to the point where I was just getting more miserable and more tired and I was coming home grumpy and miserable and I was snapping at my wife and I'd had to take a nap when I come home. So then my kids would be in bed <laughs> time I woke up and it was just like, is this what life's about? You know, is this what I'm doing with my life is, yeah, I'm making all this great money and life's good, but life's not good, you know? And he took a step back and you didn't look from the outside. You kind of questioned yourself from the inside. My, my relationship was not really struggling, but it wasn't strong. It wasn't, I was it wasn't where you want it to be. Yeah. hundred percent. Right. I didn't have that relationship with my kids. I, I coach my kids always in soccer. I've always been around. I've never not missed. Like I've always been home every night. I've always, I know I coach my kids. I, always put that time into them so I'm not saying I'm a bad parent but it's just like I wasn't giving them that attention I really could have you know I wasn't getting home till late then they'd be in bed mm -hmm. so they wake up you see them for a couple minutes and then you're out the door again and it was just this this cycle yeah so I'd go and coach them but as me running from my work to the coaching field but then I had 12 other to 20 other kids on this field that I'm also giving my attention to so I felt like I'm, I'm doing this great parenting thing but it's not just to my kids it's to everybody else as well so I just kind of started questioning myself and right around this time my mom passed away and it was just like this huge blow right and I was just like she, my mom was a happy person but she wasn't rich and I always wondered like why can you be happy why are why are you so like oh yay look I have 10 bucks to my name I can go buy a pack of smokes and you're all like yippee if I'm like 
I have a couple thousand and I'm miserable because I can't go buy this better car. I can't go do this or, and that's when I realized money does not make you happy. You need yeah, that, you, that perspective is way off. Yeah. It was, it was a fine line. Like you need money to pay for things and to not be miserable and to have the shelter and the basic needs. But then there's this fine line of how much time do you need in your day with your family, your friends and your loved ones, right? Like that's, so I started trying to spend more time with my family over making money. But then once again, things start suffering. So now bills are piling up, debts, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, and, and that's a really hard decision to make when you come from, when you don't have a safety net, right? So like when you don't have the people behind you to support or, or like the wealth of family, like, you know, I've had this conversation a million times where people are like, oh yeah, well, you know, my family, we, we, do, we don't have anything either. It's like your parents own a house, your grandparents own a house, all your aunts and uncles own a house. Do you not realize how much money that is? That's a ton of wealth. That's two generations deep. That's super helpful to you and what you're doing. I mean, some families like yourself, mine, there's none of that. There's none of that fallen, you know, you got nothing to fall back on. So we get, and I did the same thing, man. I had a business that was making killer money. It was huge. And we were like killing it. And I, I, I ended up getting divorced. I ended up losing everything. I and mean, I was, you know, I was, I think 30, 31 and I'm back living in a one bedroom apartment by myself, you know, and it's like, how did I go that full circle? And I'm right back where I effing started. And, and, you know, it's just losing perspective. Like, I mean, you're, you're, you're obviously smarter than I was cause you caught yourself and you were able to step in, but I went right off that board where I was like, you know, I need to prove to everyone. And it's a chip on your shoulder that you have that you need to prove to everyone that you can do it better and you can have those things that you never had and you can have the coolest this and that because you never had it before. And it's funny because they don't even care. It's not like they care because they've always had it, right? Rich kids are going to rich kid. Rich kids don't even notice anything because they just they just had it their whole lives and their dad's had it, their mom's had it, everyone's had it, right? And I'm not saying that no one has their own struggles. I get that everyone has their own struggles. But being a poor kid puts a big chip on your shoulder. And, and it's like and you, you said, lose. who do you yeah. who do you call? Who do you go to? Like I have yeah. zero, even to this day, I, I probably could if I really needed to. I can scrounge up five hundred bucks, but I don't even have anybody I could have called and said, "Hey, can I borrow fifty bucks from you?" I had my yeah. dad borrowing money from me. I had my brothers borrowing money from me. I had my mom borrowing money from me, and I'm still, like that was when I was still just a kid, right? So it's like mm -hmm. I've been known as the bank, and I've always had to be smarter with my money financially. You know, like at 18, I took a little finance course and I was like, why wasn't this taught in school? Why don't I know any of this? Like, it has to be done, right? So it probably was. You just skipped those days. Probably. It would have been the <laughs> math class that I was not going to. And so that's where I feel I needed to really focus was control my money, control the bleeding, save and find what's better for me and how I can give back. And so I was miserable with just busting my ass and just making money. And so I asked to go get into estimating. Like I've been with this company for eight years at this time now. And I'm like, I don't want to be on the floor anymore. My body hurts. I'm 25, 26 years old. Like everything hurts on me. My hands hurt. Like I got like carpal tunnel. My elbows are shot from just sanding and all that stuff. And my knees are garbage. And I was just young, right? I'm like, I can't do this for another 30 years. I don't want to do this for 30 years. So I moved up to estimating, which took a lot of hemming and hawing, and they brought people in before me. And you know, it was always just I had to fight for that next step. And it wasn't just like, oh, here's a position. It was just like I had to fight for it and prove it and like teach myself and always go that extra mile. And it was just like there was never a handout, never uh, a help. You know, let's pull you up. It was just like prove that you were worth it, like fight for it. So, anyways, I did everything I had to do, and I showed that I was good with customers and I could deal with it. And I got into estimating, and they trained me and. Once again, it was, it was a lot better. I love dealing with customers. I love like that, that reaction, that bond, that mm -hmm. the connection we build and that trust. But always people go, what do, what do you know? You're just this kid. And I love to go, well, I'm a kid that's been here for 11 years now. And I started in detail and I worked my way up to estimating. So obviously I, I, I know a little bit of something. And I, I would be wearing my dress clothes and I would be ripping vehicles apart <laughs> with, with my tools, ripping the bumpers off and showing them damage behind the bumper and put the vehicle back together and write up their estimate. And I build a lot of trust. 
but once again, it just wasn't giving me that meaningful work. I wasn't, why am I here? You know, I was still trying to, I'm trying to figure that out is what's my reason to be here? Why, why am I, why am I here? And I thought estimating was going to help kind of make me feel like I'm doing good for the world and helping find that purpose. And, but then I was working still really late at night, my employer, same employer, but just, you know, I moved around to different locations. They kind of just didn't give me that respect again. I wasn't, I should have been a manager. I should have been at the top. I had more experience and knowledge and passion for the industry than my managers. And I just felt like, okay, I don't want this anymore. I'm just, I'm not happy. Yeah, you're paying. And I took a 50% pay cut to go up to estimating. So I took a huge pay cut just to be back at the bottom again. In a just, different role, yeah. Right? So I was like, okay, yeah, I just don't want to do this anymore. What's my purpose? What's my reason? And just right around this time, I was kind of just COVID hit and I was put on shift works where like three days a week we're working. I was off two days a week and I'm doing a lot of side things and and careers reached out. Our our CEO president, Andy Nigel, reached out because I've done speeches for careers before. They helped me get my first placement with uh, Herber's Auto Body back in high school. Mm-hmm. I've done speeches for them, kind of kept in touch. And he's like, hey, we have this position of business engagement. Do you want to come and help find employment for our students that are enrolling in our programs? And I'm like, you guys pay? You guys would pay me to come work for you? I'm like, <laughs> when do I, when can I start? Like, I didn't know this was even an option. And so that's kind of when it started. And I did my resume, came out for a couple of interviews, and, and they hired me. So that's how I did this full circle of, starting in school, not even knowing where I was going because of the careers next generation and the work they do. They connected me as a high school student to my employer, helped me get my apprenticeship started, get me indentured, keep connecting, keep kind of keep me on track. And then just gave me that, that path and that guide way to that, you know, that guide to find my passion when I was younger. And now I get to give back and I get to find employment for students and give my story and now this is what I'm feeling my purpose in life. And like I say, even if I won the lottery, while my kids are in school, I would still be doing this job. You know, and that's how I feel like I've succeeded. And this is something I would love to do. And I want to continue to do it because even if I won the lottery, I would still be here doing this work. Well, and I tell you, man, the, your story is not over, right? Like things are going to keep happening and, and things keep evolving and, and you're going to learn lots about yourself. And I think that's really one of the things that you learn about success, you know, and success is it's really about just learning about yourself. You spend a lot of time trying to show something to other people. Um, and then the realization comes that they're not looking, they don't care. They're, they're worried about their own narrative, right? I, I had someone tell me that once that every human being is the main character in their own movie. Right. And so when you watch a movie, do you think about the, the characters on the side of the screen that it flashed? You don't give a f- right. You, you don't even think about them for a um, second because all you worry about is the main character and the story that's coming out. E- every human is the main character in their story. When you start to lose focus is when you start trying to make other people the main character in your story. And that shouldn't be. You got to worry about yourself and figuring out where you go and write your own story. You write your own narrative. And good things that happen to you, it's because of you. Bad things happen to you, it's also because of you, right? So that you you got to get on that, right? And you got to figure out how to how to fix that. And it's never over. Like man, I'm 45 years old. Let me tell you, I've been up and down. I've had failed businesses, a failed marriage. I've had all sorts of things up and I I hated my trade for a long time, and now I love it again. And now I'm advocating for it, you know, and much like how you are. And I still get surprised every now and then being like, what, what, what's this new thing? Or, or, or I thought this would make me feel good, but it doesn't. Or I thought this was going to suck, but it's awesome. Like, I mean, you're, you figure those things out. What, what is careers next gen? Just for people outside of Alberta that are listening to this, they're like, what, what is he talking about? You know? Great. Good thing you asked that because I had a little part I want to put into this here. So yes, careers <laughs> the next generation. Uh, Don't read. tell me you're going to read. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm not going to read all of it, but I'll kind of sum it up here. So we're a unique not-for-profit organization that introduces high school students to different industries. So the registered apprenticeship program is a skilled trades. 
We have a health side of it where we help students get into like health internships. A lot of that's just old folks homes or retirement homes working with uh, seniors doing stuff like that. We also have um, Indigenous Youth Careers Pathways where we work with a lot of Indigenous youth we go into reserves and we try to find them meaningful work. So it's not just the trades, not just health, but if they said, hey, I want to be uh, an engineer, I want to work in a bank, I, whatever they want or they're trying to feel passionate about is our job to go help find the connections. We have career coaches for them to kind of help them get better resumes, to understand what to expect in an interview. We do a lot of work with Indigenous youth in Alberta. We have a program called Information Communication Technologies, brand new, but this is where we're taking students that want to get into technology of anything. And with this one, it's so broad that it's just like we have from as simple as a website designer to social media to people that want to be software engineers. And so we're trying to find all these different positions through there as well. So is this only available for high school, like people high school, or can you be like just for example, let's say I'm 30 and I want a career change. Is there a place for me there or is this a targeting kids in school? Yeah, so we're only targeting high school students right now. Okay. Um, so that's usually grade 11, grade 12 students. If they do re-enroll, so they can come back, I think, up to 20. So if you can re-enroll and upgrade as long as you're connected to a high school, mm -hmm. we can get them, find them placement in one of our programs. Um, in Fort McMurray, they because this is where RAP started, was in Fort McMurray in 97 the employers kind of started realizing there wasn't a lot of young talent coming through and they're losing all these senior people. So that's where it started with Fort McMurray and they wanted to build young apprentices to continue to like grow them and move them up. So they have a co-op program in Fort McMurray. I think it's up to 30, but they work with them and they get them the first year apprenticeship. And then they work with you all the way to your journeyman. So every single year they rotate you from one employer to another employer. But as you go into your second year, your third year, fourth year, we help give them all the all the parts Sports, of their trade, yeah. yeah. And so that's only offered to Fort McMurray with Eric up there and they're doing great work with that and it's helping take them all the way through and kind of hold their hands and get them in employment and keep them going and grow as these apprentices. So those are the only ones that are a little bit older, but for the rest of the province, we're pretty much, we're limited at the high school, maybe grade 13, grade 14, if you're upgrading a few years. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, you know, in your role now, basically as like a business outreach person that you got to contact companies. How do you do that? Do you go to the company and say, hey, hey will you take some students or do you go through a, a program? Are you cold calling people? Are you just walking in the front door? Like, how do you do that? All of the above, whatever gets going. So with COVID, I'm really limited just working from home, doing a lot of cold calls, emails, trying to figure out the decision makers. So there's, if you want a tough job, sit here and just get no's all day, especially during COVID. <laughs> I probably get told no a hundred times a day. But in my head, I know every no is that much closer to a yes. Um, so yeah, just a lot of cold calls, a lot of reaching out. We have this amazing incentive program that Careers the Next Generation is giving employers to take students. So we have three levels of commitment, either 125 hours, 240 hours, or 480 hours. And once the minimum hours have been completed, the employer would get back either $1,000, $1,800, or $3,600 back. So employers, even though we're in COVID and it's tough, employers hear that, they're like, wait a minute, I can get money back and take a student and it kind of solves my problems here. So that's really, really helped since January, open up employers to kind of think, well, hopefully COVID's going to be over. We're going to need employees. Why not kind of get paid for it now, train them up, and then be running at what they need to be. So that's how I'm kind of enticing them to to help out. And I kind of tell my story as well. I can say, you know, this is a little bit of my story. This is what you're doing for these youth and entice them on that. But it's never an easy obstacle to convince people to take students. No, and it's tough, but it's such a double-edged sword, right? Like they're going to need that tradesperson in four to five years when they're done school, but they're not willing to invest in them at the start when they're just getting into school but they're going to complain that they don't have that worker in four to five years. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and let me tell you, across Canada, we, we got this huge shortage of tradespeople coming up. Like it's, it's happening right now. But for the young people that are just entering the trades now, they think because it's a shortage of tradespersons that getting a job is easier. And that's not necessarily true. You still got to 
like yourself, like me, like anybody else that we know, you still got to prove yourself and you still got to get in there and you still going to have to make minimum wage and bust your butt. And it doesn't matter if you're the last welder or body, body person in the world, your first job is going to be at the bottom. And that's just the way it is. And, and I know like personally as a teacher and as a shop owner and people and been in the business for so long that Lots of young trades people get into the trades and are, are disillusioned in the first year and then quit because they thought that they were going to come in and just make bank right off the top. And that's not realistic. And then I run into these same students 10 years later and they've had five careers and they just keep trying to find that career that's just going to make them rich instantly and get super discouraged when they don't get rich instantly. And, and that's a disconnect. I don't know where they got that idea from. But that's not reality. There's there's no job that does that, you know. And that's exactly it is. I've I trained a lot of apprentices and that was their thing. They come in here thinking it's gonna be so much easier. They get their first paycheck and they go, Well, why is the paycheck so small? I made more money <laughs> hourly working somewhere else. I'm like, that's what you get to start, you know? And it's like I had this one friend, I started with him ground zero, you know, and I started training him up, training him up and I, I was like good friends with him would hang with him and his wife and his kids and they saw what I accomplished and they're a little bit older than me and his wife always kept saying like how do you have this like I see his paychecks how are you guys having this I'm like it gets easier I promise you like right now is garbage but it gets easier you make more money you get better at your your trade and life starts to open up and they're gonna he was gonna quit he wasn't making enough money you know they had the full house blah 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 and I'm like Dale don't quit don't quit just keep pushing through pushing through and I haven't spoken to them really since COVID started here, but before that, they're getting better. You know, money wasn't an issue anymore. They're like, life was just working out for them. And it just mm-hmm. goes to show that you can't compare yourself to your your boss and the guy that's been there for 10 years before you, because you didn't see his struggle to get there. You'd go, oh, he has this nice car. He has this nice house. He has this, you know, all this beautiful stuff. Well, I want it too. Why does he have it? Yeah. And it's just like, well, Cause you're just washing cars today. You got to go through the hoops to get to that. Yeah. And that's, that's what the trades mean. You know, I, I love, I love the old, old sayings people tell me, but you know, what, why do they call trades the trades? Cause you trade your time, right? You got to trade your time. That's what you're trading. You know, people are like, what is, why do they use the words trades for the, these type of jobs? Because we trade our lives away for success. We put the time in. It's not an instant thing. It's, it's something that you just have to work at. And in the old days, they would call it mastery. You know, you'd have to get a mastery of a trade and they don't, they don't use that terminology anymore, but I think it's a fitting term. You know, you start off as a novice, you move into apprentice and you finish as a master and, and you can't skip that. You can't show up to Kung Fu day one, get one good kick on the bag and be like, give me my black belt. Like, I mean, that's just not how it works. You got to, no matter how good you are, you got to follow the path that's been laid out. And it's been laid out by thousands of people over hundreds of years. And so it's proven. You're not going to come in and shake that up. You know, just just do it. And some people get through the path quick because they're super good. But it's still the path. You just got to do it, right? Exactly, right. And with my apprenticeship, it wasn't like my first year, second year, third year, fourth year, back to back to back to schooling. It actually took me, I think, like six, seven years to completely finish all my years from just the way the school lined up and everything. Mm-hmm. And I jumped over people that were started before me, but it's because they just didn't want to push it. They didn't want to pursue it. They didn't want, they weren't in the boss's office saying, hey, there's a class that starts a couple of weeks. Why aren't I enrolled in that yet? And you mm-hmm. can't just expect anything handed to you ever. And it just, oh, and that's a good point too. Take any training you get for all young people. You want to move up a ladder, you take any training you get offered, doesn't matter from where or from who, you jump on it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And just even as, as an adult, you know, if somebody's going to teach you something, why don't you learn it? Even if it's not a trade or if it's like as simple as a plumber coming in and fixing your pipe, why don't you just kind of like watch him for a second and now you've got some free knowledge and you just continue <laughs> to grow as a person. Yeah. Well, Ryland, man, we blew through an hour just like that. And, and so I'm going to have to cut her down and we might have to do a round two. To, to continue this conversation and, and also just to keep up with your career and see where you're at, you know, I'd like to kind of come back around and check in, but I ask everybody on the podcast, same question. I'm going to ask you, 
what would be the one piece of advice you'd give a young person, especially in your career, um, a high school person? What would you say to them coming out of high school, coming into a trade as a piece of advice to help them succeed? If you want it, go for it. Don't let other people tell you you can't have your dreams and your goals because they're afraid to achieve their dreams and goals. If I believed every time somebody told me, no, don't go for it, I would have nothing and I'd be exactly where my parents are. Nothing against what my parents are, did, but it's just want it, go for it. No excuses. It's not an easy road. Just fight for it. I'm a nobody and I achieve what I want to achieve. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. Yeah, down the street. All right, buddy. Well, I appreciate your time, Rylan. I, I hope to see you again. And I'm sure when I'm out in Alberta, I'll give you a ring and see how you're doing. Um, finally, you know, once I get my vaccination, I think I'm going to get it in a week or so here. I'm super pumped. So uh, then I, then we can start doing some more hangouts. But I appreciate you being on the show. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Yeah, you bet. And for all the people listening and downloading and sharing, thanks for the continued success of the podcast. We're doing great, and that's all because of you guys. Make sure you download it. Make sure you share it. Spread the wealth. Let people know about this. And if you got any cool uh, people that you think might be interested in being on the show or a story that's worth telling, the doors are open. This uh, this this channel, this media channel, this podcast is for is for the membership of the CWB Association and all the people out there that are grinding hard. So, so thanks for listening and thanks for following. We Take hope care. you enjoy the show. You've been listening to the CWB Association Welding Podcast with Max Cerrone. If you enjoyed what you heard today, rate our podcast and visit us at cwbassociation.org to learn more. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions or suggestions on what you'd like to learn about in the future. Produced by the CWB Group and presented by Max Herman. This podcast serves to educate and connect the welding community. Please subscribe and thank you for listening.